information. Uh, so if you can't read at the back, uh, like I asked, how do I query the database? And they're like, it's not a database, it's a true value store. And I said, uh, okay, it's not a database, how do I query it? You write a distributed mapping function in Erlang. <laughs> you just tell me to go fuck myself? I think I did, Bob. So um, that's been the state of affairs up until now, and it's not a pretty situation. And, and that's not completely true. I mean, there's been efforts on um, different query languages like HTQL um, for querying edge base, um, some page integration with edge base and others. Um, so uh, the state of the art is advancing, and I'm going to give basically a progress report on the work I've been doing um, with high edge base integration. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so anyway, my name's John Suki, and um, I joined the Hive team at Facebook about the beginning of this year, and I've been learning MapReduce and, and um, the whole Hadoop ecosystem since then. And so Hive, if you're not familiar, is um, a sub-project in the Hadoop ecosystem, and it's basically a data warehousing system on top of Hadoop, and you can think of it as uh, SQL on top of MapReduce. And HBase is another sub-project in Hadoop, and it's basically a clone of Google's Bigtable, uh, targeting Hadoop instead. Um, so basically API row-level access to Mapper's, uh, you can think of it as either key value store or uh, column store or whatever. Um, but the key differentiator is that you can access individual items inside of a table in HBase. Um, and manipulate them and query them independently, whereas Hive, you're typically going to be working on large batches of rows, whether for reading or writing. Um, so Hive is awesome, HBase is awesome, and putting it together we get quadratic awesomeness. And um, maybe SQL, what does that mean? It's like, okay, up till now, you've been forced to choose either, okay, go the SQL way, go the no SQL way. Maybe SQL, well, with integration like this, you can put the two together and where appropriate, continue to work directly at the NoSQL level, but where it makes sense for large batch reporting or whatever, then be able to use a high level language like the one that Hive provides uh, for saving your productivity times. So I'm gonna go over uh, a little bit about why we're doing this at Facebook um, and some, some very simple use cases, um, and then the architecture of how we put together Hive and HBase. Uh, a little bit about the changes we made to Hive in order to make it possible to plug in something like HBase underneath instead of going direct to HTFS. Uh, and then walk through a little about how you use it at the SQL level and how it works internally. So, why? Um, well, first of all, most of this was ripped from a slide about just why Hive in the first place. Data, data, and more data. Um, I don't know who has the bigger cluster now, Facebook or Yahoo, somebody here might know, but uh, we, we grown-ups can probably disclose. Um, but it's a lot of data, obviously. If you went to F8 today, I think there was an announcement about community pages, and we're making a lot more data every day. Um, and so um, the Hive team were responsible for dealing with that data flooding in, um, coming out of the transactional systems, which are in MySQL. Um, every time you click your status update or say that you like a particular page or whatever it is, um, that's, that's flowing into the Hive warehouse. Um, so, um, not just data, but also the query streaming against it. Uh, users for supporting operations like, um, say, F8 itself, are running queries all day long to try to figure out, okay, how are people responding to different kinds of new features? Um, you know, advertisers, everybody else wants to get at all that data that we have stored up. And more and more, they're not satisfied with just data from a day ago or even half a day ago. They'd like to be closer to real time. And so obviously HBase gives us the ability to start moving towards a, a, a low latency, at least kind of experience for users instead of having to wait for data to get pumped into the warehouse through Hive. Um, so in particular, the way we're thinking about it is fact data continues to stay pretty much just in Hive. Um, fact data is typically append only, which is something like clicks uh, on you know a, a particular uh, Facebook page, 
um, or somebody um, going off and seeing an ad or, or those kinds of fact information. But dimension data, like your user profile or the contents of a page that you like or something like that, um, is a lot smaller than the fact data, but changes in a way that's uh, an update pattern instead of an entanglement pattern. So we see it as pretty much keep the fact data um, where it is, but go to a low latency mode for the dimension data so HA could be a good candidate for that. Um, and the factors that go into that on the dimension side is we currently actually basically take a full snapshot of the dimension table from the transactional system on a daily basis, not just the rows that change, but typically maybe 1% of the rows change, something like that. So that's very expensive. We're wasting a lot of resources and storage moving that data through. Um, and there's no way using Hive by itself that we could propagate just the row changes into the warehouse. So again, H rate could be a good candidate there. Um, and whatever we do for this, we need it to integrate into Hive's MapReduce query processing, and HBase already has MapReduce operators available for it, so we want to be able to leverage that. Um, and the last bullet here, multi-versioning, um, is one that we're not sure how well it'll work with HBase, but HBase does provide the ability to basically say, okay, keep several versions of a row, and you control the retention based on storage. And so we might want to be able to use that for a way to say, hey, when we're doing queries back against old fact data, you know, give me a, a corresponding snapshot of the dimension data. That's not the highest priority. The highest priority is just dealing with a massive flood of data. Okay, so a few use cases for what you can do once you have Hive and HBase integrated. A very simple one is uh, if you already have an existing HBase uh, instance set up and you'd like to use Hive essentially as an extract transform load tool to pump into it. Um, maybe you have some uh, new data to write into HBase, maybe you're migrating from an old version of HBase, whatever. Again, from a productivity perspective, it's a lot easier to express these things in SQL instead of having to go off and start a MapReduce job for every one of them. So as long as you can express it as a Hive insert select statement, now you'll be able to target your HBase table as the target of the insert statement, and the rest of it works the exact same way. Next case would be once you've got your data into HBase, again, it might be your existing HBase system or you might have just loaded up from Hive, um, then be able to run large batch queries against it. These could be group buys, joins, unions, and these can be either against multiple HBase tables or single HBase table or combining HBase tables with existing Hive tables. That's all possible once you have a Hive and HBase integrated. And finally, this is the picture that we're looking for uh, for the Facebook warehouse, is to be able to have essentially a federated system. Like I mentioned, fact data periodically being loaded with um, the, the stuff that's come in, say, from the latest hours worth of logs or something like that, combined seamlessly with dimension data that's continuously being updated as, as the events happen. Um, and then for the Hive queries to sit on top of them and combine them in a way that the, the person querying the warehouse doesn't know whether this data was coming from one or the other. Um, it's just within a latency difference now that it's in HBase instead of doing a daily load or something like that in Hive. Um, so this, this is the one that the team I'm working on is most interested. There's other teams that are more interested in, okay, they already have an HBase database to be able to do um, SQL queries against it. Okay, so um, a little bit about uh, HBase itself, uh, if you're not familiar with it. Basically, it sits directly on top of HDFS. The MapReduce part is optional. You don't have to use MapReduce, but you do have to have HDFS set up under HBase. And HBase runs a number of server processes called region servers, and then a master process that coordinates the region servers and splits up um, according to uh, the row keys coming into the system, figures out which region servers to handle a particular operation. And um, there's another Apache, uh, uh, Hadoop component, Zookeeper, which deals a map design or something like that, and then the cluster of maps within read it. And then client programs talk to Zookeeper and the master to figure out then where to go to get the actual data we can run. And Hive is similar in that it sits up on top of Hadoop, except it relies on MapReduce for actually executing queries. And so it's got a client-side component that basically does all of the traditional stages of SQL query preparation parsing, uh, optimization, generating a plan, but the plan itself is actually a MapReduce program, and so that gets submitted over to Hadoop for execution. Okay, 
so when we put it together then we actually have theoretically two different hadoop clusters now you can run it this way with two different hadoop clusters or you can run it all your side against the same hadoop cluster it should work either way the key is that hive when it talks to hbase it's always talking through the cloud transmitter the road path um so this has its pluses and minuses it keeps basically the two systems independent you see in the front rows there are that can become keys in map objects and there are corresponding values that become values in map um so this way you can map a sparse column family uh directly into hive and still manipulate it with hive lock or the same problems that cap or cap has and um for for columns where they actually do appear once per row non-sparse type columns then you would typically map it over into a primitive type column inside of hive um or a list if it happens in an array or a space or something like that um and uh a few limitations that we're working on to fix one is that right now everything gets stored as a string inside of hbase which isn't very useful for our binary data in hbase and that's just a pretty trivial thing inside of a kb and um currently there's no way to access the hbase timestamps and this is kind of important if you're really new to uh to this um when you write rows you should be able to specify what timestamps you need not just say what the row is below it necessarily um and when you read rows you should be able to filter them on timestamps if they've been written to the right snapshot of the data for right now the timestamps are just invisible from the hive perspective okay so once you've created the table um and oh and by the way if you had an existing table already in hbase you can use hive's create external table command and that just registers the existing command when it's created in new inside of hbase so then you can um either write into that table or read from it um so one way or the other once we have the table defined in hive and it's just a stack type function in hbase uh we can write new rows into it using hive's standard insert command um and it turns out that hbase already has a mapdb um table output format so hive really just uses that and wraps it with some of its own um record processing stuff um and so the table output format does all the work of creating back update objects and and writing them into hbase um and then hive's stored handler provides a, a query that takes the rows uh coming from hive and turning it into that back update format um something interesting to note is if you're working with hive normally there's no notation of a key on a table so you can actually have essentially multiple rows with the same key value hbase does have a notation of key and so if you write multiple rows with the same key value into a hbase back table you're only going to get one row written into hbase because other ones happen to come in last in the hadoop tree um you have to be a little bit careful with that um and some other nuts things to note about uh what happens when you write into the hbase table there's no write atomicity so for example if some of your registers fail and are just a key hbase is going to then freeze a um a inconsistent query on on the target table normally hive like waits till the very end of the query execution gets all the files ready in the temporary area and then moves them over to the right location the stored handler doesn't do anything like that and there's currently no way to delete it's insert only so we could either add the delete command to hive or maybe when we add the timestamp support it would give you a way to mark a special timestamp that you have to delete as well um and a little bit of a gut on on the right uh execution itself and how it's done in parallel um so this shows the mapdb plan for a particular hive insert statement so assuming it came up with a mapdb plan it's fine you're going to get parallelism depending on the number of reducers inside of the query so in this case if you have three reducers they're going to be writing in parallel to hbase but if your plan turned out to be a map only plan which is which is possible if you're not doing any any group buys or any other operations this is great insert commit then you might end up with um the map operators writing in hbase with no reducers so the key here is just to keep in mind that if you care about the degree of parallelism with your hbase cluster so so that you don't kill it you have to look a little bit into the hive plan possibly doing some gun just to to know whether it's a map only plan or a map db plan and then um figuring out you know the number of mappers the number of reducers and and um making sure that the splits happen in such a way that you get the degree of parallelism you want Ideally you would just have a knob that says give me this degree of parallelism and and then um to kill that empty object from hive. Okay, now 
change that data inside of HSpace as you get back out with the next statement. Um, they, you, again, you might mentioned before, you can use an, any type of SQL operators in existence, CDFs and um, BDPFs and uh, standard SQL constructs like union and group type. And again, HSpace already provided the table input format that I uses, and the survey again gets to the middle to um, basically take the shell maps coming out of HSpace and then turn those into, into high records. Um, and when you are executing a query against HSpace, um, what to do in parallel with EDs next? Well, I've actually called over to HSpace um, to say, hey, how many splits should I use for this particular query execution? And splits when produced basically give you um, basically uh, for each mapper, tell us which region of the of the data being accessed that mapper should access. So HBase already has a way to say, hey, um, figure out from each region server uh, how to make up a split that represents that region. So as a result, when your query executes, each mapper will be hitting one region server. Now again, because we're going through the client API, it's not like having directly accessing those region files, but it's going to be one to one to each thing that has mapper and a corresponding region server. So each region server would understand it exactly in the client. And that might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing, so you probably need to do some investigation and your um, CDF server type stuff to figure out could a region server support more than one of this kind of thing. For now, it's just one to one. Um, and um, when your high query executes, if you only select, say, three columns out of 10 region maps into HSpace, then um, the corresponding scan object in HSpace is going to know to only access those columns. So as a result, it sh if you have the column family set up right, you can avoid this access on the HSpace side for the columns that aren't being accessed. Um, and that's another reason to be careful about your column family. Um, something important that's missing is filter percent. So we do push down the, the column selection, but we don't say, hey, for whatever your filter was, particularly on the row key, HSpace only uh, we only want you to access those rows. Currently, it's going to scan the entire HSpace table and then do all the filtering on the high side. Um, so this is an important optimization that needs to be added. HSpace also has um, the ability to create a secondary index view, um, and we haven't exposed that here either. So once we do the filter push down, we'd also like to be able to say, uh, have HSpace take advantage of any of those indexes that are listed in, inside of its schema. Um, and the last bullet here on the limitation is about how do we achieve locality. Well, um, what I mentioned before about the splits, um, we really like the high map uh, path to be running on the same node where the region server is running. That may already be happening automatically. We're not quite there, so we'll need to activate that some more. Um, because otherwise, you're going to have a lot of extra info traffic that's not really necessary. So we'd, we'd like the map to the region server to run, run end to end. Finally, on the Metastore integration, I mentioned before that when we uh, make the DBO call to create a table, um, we're actually calling into both Hive Metastore and HSpace's uh, administrative interface uh, at the same time to keep the two catalogs in sync. And the cookie administration, to be aware of there, is that if something does crash in, in the middle on the client side, it's possible for the two to be out of sync. We're not using two page permits for the DBO itself. Um, in most cases, that's just a matter of them standing up and using the corresponding uh, high level of HSpace administrative command to drive in the, the data object. We haven't put in all the table yet. Um, that should be pretty easy to do. But for now, you have to create a new table um, if you change the definition. And we don't have a notion of how to map high partitions into HSpace tables. There's a lot of possibilities there. One would be like a high partition corresponds to a particular timestamp value. Another one would be um, that we actually create new HSpace tables that correspond to high partitions. But for now, it's just there's no partitions in, in uh, tables that are not themselves in HSpace window. Um, and then as I mentioned, we haven't uh, exposed any way to filter index um, to help you get filter push down. OK, finally, um, the insert that I mentioned before for row level, um, that's, that's great. But if you've got a massive amount of data to get into HSpace um, to get it set up in the first place, then that can be kind of slow, just like with a position table like where you've got to do something like superloading instead of um, instead of doing row by row inserts. 
So it actually tries to walk through how you can actually use hive uh, to do the bulk load uh, and to isolate without having to write an off-the-beat program, which is what you tra traditionally had to do in order to do a bulk load in early stage. Um, so ideally, you would just be able to run an input statement and to into an isolate program and give it a special mode that says, hey, use a bulk loader. But in fact, it takes a few jobs under the cover to make it happen. So because Hive doesn't have an optimizer of this uh, expressiveness yet, um, we have actually have to do some of the work manually ourselves. Um, so the, the basic idea is that you need to sort all of your data and then use a special H file output format provided by HBase, which will then um, uh, already be in the format that the region servers understand, and then you just tell HBase about it when it's catalogued. Um, the sorting is the hard part, and so if you look at like the Theraflow benchmarks from from Yahoo for running um, a, a big sort on Hadoop, um, it takes a little bit of work to get Hadoop to do that, because most of the time Hadoop wants to do everything by app partitioning, and you have to tell it to do something different to do it um, instead of baby partitioning. Um, and so instead of trying to explain that briefly, um, this diagram shows what range, how range partitioning works inside of the, the sort. So the idea is we want each reducer to sort a subset of the data, um, but we also need a total order. By the time it gets to HBase, the row IDs actually need to be um, broken up into different regions that, that are not hash based, but actually have contiguous values based on A to Z, H to Q, and R to Z if you're using alphabetical row IDs. Um, so as a result, when we're doing the sort, we cannot use the standard hash partitioner that comes with Hadoop. So instead, we use a total order partitioner, which is provided by Hadoop. And all it needs in order to work is um, basically a set of breakpoints inside of the data to tell the first incoming tuple which reducer should it go to. Um, so in this example, we need to give it the Q, T, H, and R, which are the corresponding breakpoints uh, between the three reducers. So your number of breakpoints always going to be one less than the number of reducers that you're trying to run at the end of the sort. Um, so, so then it becomes a two-step process. The first step is to actually come up with those breakpoints. Then the second step is to run the sort, telling the total order partitioner to use those breakpoints. Um, so sorry if this is getting like really low level and like IT detail, but you actually want to um, get started with HBase and use Hive in order to do it to do the bulk load then um, it, it takes a little bit of setup to make that happen. Um, the, this example just shows like, okay, given a bunch of data, how would we run a sampling query to find those breakpoints without actually having to look at the data ourselves? And so you just can use nest and, and hive table sampling to sort in order to take a subset of the data to sort there and then and then find every nth row that becomes a breakpoint. And then um, you, we're gonna use that same distribution uh, for sorting your data. Once you've got those breakpoints set up, then there's a bunch of um, configurations we need to do to control the actual uh, sort once it runs. For example, setting the number of reducers uh, to match the number of breakpoints you got, um, and telling where to find the breakpoint file. And then finally, this last input statement is actually going to do the sort itself using the cluster by feature of Hive, which is gonna set up uh, that partitioner. And then um, the results are gonna be written out to these um, H files, which are then going to be shipped over to HBase and say, um, here's our paper data. So um, it's still not easy to do something like that, but at least with Hive, your productivity can focus on at least thinking about the logic and mapping uh, into HBase and not with writing code in order to, to do the sorting itself. And then just a little bit about what we have set up so, so far. As I mentioned, this is really a progress report because we've done most of this code development up to now, and then we're starting with some production testing with real data. Um, so in order to get the HBase integration, you need to pull the latest Hive chunk, and you're using it to do code up 20 at least. Um, and we've been testing with HBase code up 20.3. HBase has a new release coming out, and we have a bunch of patches internally um, from Yahoo and from, from our own uh, developers um, to do the modified version of HBase that we're testing there. And eventually those should all get rolled back into the main code line. Um, so we're actually doing stuff in the multi node cluster right now, just not, not to break the, the main test of production clusters. Um, 
And as, as we get to Palm Beach, I'm going to be showing the golf club and some of the actual birds and, and lights. Um, we'll try to publish some of that for the Dallas uh, Sun's level of expectations that you can get if you play within the Golden Gate. And that's all I have so far. I, um, I'm hoping once we have some more members there to do some job fairs and, and make some more presentations to um, the staff and principals here for the community. Um, but if you have questions or comments as of now, um, or you can email me at Facebook um, or join the IG Green Room where you can ask questions there. Um, Tom, can you take like one or two questions? Uh, if you have any, if you have one more presentation. Right, so that's where right now they're always going in as bins inside of booth space. So if you happen to have binary data already inside the booth space, you won't be able to access it. So that's something we need to actually um, enhance the way that they do work to get us more information about how they take um, the data. So that's the that's part of mentioning limitation right now is we have no awareness of secondary indexing, but that would certainly make sense to have a few task jobs, for example, that say like um, you know feed the sheep into the bird index with the other ones. Yeah, and like the key to the optimizing.